and we're live. Hey, I feel like we should introduce a drum roll and a, and a cymbal crash. <laughs> the trouble is you can't time it with Facebook. You never quite know when it's gone live. Your your orchestra background is coming yeah, out here. You're going to you know, orchestrate the, the music for our... Yeah, oh. it's more of a music theater kind of instinct. It's like, you know, if somebody walks across the room, I used to accompany them on the piano just because I get bored. I'm like, no, we need some underlay here. <laughs> anyway, man, <laughs> we're talking very serious business topics today. And, and uh, here we are stopping in the comic mode. But we're talking about yeah. ladder traps, which is, I think, a very cool concept. When you sent me the, the outline for this... Uh, as we do you know and we tend to take it in turns or swap yeah. around i'm like this is really cool this is something that needs discussion so i'm looking forward to this and we're yeah. not going to reveal yeah. what ladder traps are i guess and so you have to stay listening to find out what that is well exactly right so it's going to be a great conversation if you're joining us live hello hello welcome to uh the live broadcast recording of the e-commerce leader podcast we is as our tradition record these on sunday mornings and then we uh take off the mp3 file and put it everywhere podcasts are done so you get the benefit of hearing us live do this conversation and uh yeah it's going to be a great time so yeah ladder traps ladder traps what are ladder traps well we're going to explain it hopefully it's a little bit of a mystery hook phrase i don't know if it will ever rise to the occasion of being an economics principle or whatever you know how such things get established i'm not sure but this is a big important topic for business owners and so it'll be a good time i think diving into it. So if you're listening to us live, feel free to um, leave a comment underneath wherever you're listening. Say hello. Tell us where you're listening from. Um, ask uh, any questions you'd like us to address in the uh, in the show, and uh, we'll go from there. So, Michael, you ready to... Uh, I'm ready to do this, yeah. I'm just going to pop a comment that says, please feel free to make a comment. But apart from that, <laughs> that hmm. profound action, I'm ready to roll on this topic. I'm really looking forward to this. It's a really cool topic, in my opinion. All right, let's do it. I'll, I'll uh, kick us off here. Here we go. Some e-commerce business decisions have a big price to pay, and worse, they're not easily changed after you make them. One of the worst of these is called the ladder trap. And in this episode, we're going to discuss the concept, explain what it means, how to avoid the nasty, pernicious effects of stepping into the ladder trap, and how to really untangle it if you've made such mistakes. So, Michael, are you ready to jump into this fun topic today? I am. I, I like the mystery. So, obviously, I've got the benefit of having a talk to you about it. But uh, tell us what the ladder trap is. What is this mysterious thing? Sure. Yeah. Well, we've all heard the phrase, uh, before you climb a ladder, make sure it's leaning against the right wall. That kind of idea or something along those lines. Usually, that's related to career, climbing the ladder or something like that. But in business operations and e-commerce in particular, um, we can play with that metaphor and extend it even further. And so I want to do that. I want to take that metaphor and kind of um, unpack it and apply it specifically to e-commerce um, in a few specific areas. And so so let me uh, let me just flesh it out for a moment. And then Michael, I love your your commentary on this as well. So just imagine that you you climb a ladder and on each rung of that ladder, you have a positive outcome that increases with every step you go up, therefore making it harder to climb down or abandon that ladder or to reposition it somewhere else. The logical move in that case is to keep climbing the ladder. The problem with that is frequently we can get in these situations where we're four, five, six steps up a ladder and we realize we don't like this. We, we, you know, we're stuck, we're trapped. This is not where we want to be in our business. Now that's on the positive reinforcement side, like we're getting sort of this positive benefit uh, and it's trapping us. The other angle on this is sometimes with ladder traps, you make a serious commitment or decision and it has massive economic consequence to you and you're stuck into it. And it's like the first rung on the ladder is a bear trap and it springs closed on your foot and you're on that ladder. And you're not getting off easily. And so these are the ideas that we can play with as it relates to our e-commerce business and understanding how to deal with these big decisions uh, and how to uh, how to make sure that we don't get stuck in them uh, unwisely. Yeah. Definitely an important point. And, and I think this is the sort of thing, if you've been in business for a few years, you're really going to 
resonate with this i think i certainly as soon as you said it, i'm like oh wow yes this mm -hmm. this is actually really really important in my own businesses i've seen it in my clients businesses um i remember you said something like be careful what rut you pick because you're going to be in it a long time and i guess it relates to the habit two of the seven habits of highly effective people by stephen covey uh really solid book in terms of leadership principles i think and he mm -hmm. says begin with the end in mind and he says the difference between leadership and management in to use this metaphor is management's how to move up the ladder but leadership's making sure you positioned it against the right tree in the first place so mm -hmm. that's why the word leader which is part of our podcast title because we're both passionate about it it really is i think more important than you think it is on the on the day to day because it's so easy to think oh i just need to buy you know get more product lines whether that's buying more as a reseller or developing more as a private label seller um develop more sales channels and that's it. but actually that is really not necessarily true <laughs> because as you say if you're on the wrong ladder then the further you go the more vigorously you go the worse you make the situation and that's actually pretty frighteningly common i think wow yeah i hadn't i hadn't remembered that uh seven habits of highly effective people tie in but that is actually a great connection point and so it's fun to kind of link this i guess to stephen covey's work so that's interesting yeah, no, I totally so, agree. It's it's a big deal. Yeah, it is. And and so, how does it specifically show up in e-commerce businesses in in your experience? Yeah, well, I think the, the it's a decision making model that we want to apply to the the you know many choices inside of our business. But I would just say there's probably a priority list of decisions or or big choices that you make as a, a founder, and they are um they are you know kind of the short list of big, big <laughs> ladder traps. Uh, and the first, and I'll just mention a few here, and Michael, I'm sure you have some more as well. But the the first one I would say is your uh, founding team or your any co-founder arrangement. You know, if you start a business with a partner, you've made a massive decision. And that decision is a big, big, you know, initial ladder that you're climbing up. You're going in one direction with that decision and it becomes increasingly difficult to uh, climb down that ladder and reposition. So that's one. The second one I would say is the niche or industry that you choose. And choosing a niche or industry, if you're a veteran in that industry and then you launch a business into it, you go into it with the full knowledge of who the people are, what they're like, the pros and cons of you know the, uh, the customers and uh, the industry. But if you launch a business in an industry that you don't have any background or familiarity with, you're really blind going into it with no idea whether the customers are cool people to you or not cool people to you, whether they're ethical to you or not ethical to you, uh, whether the you know uh, collaborators in your space are going to be cool to work with or not, whether your uh, competitors are going to be ethical and compete kind of, you know, with the you know, kind of, I guess, you, can you say gentlemen's or gentle people's, uh, you know, ethics, or are they going to be totally deceptive and evil? And so these are, these are big choices related to your niche industry. Uh, uh, you know, another big ladder trap would be the product line you launch. Launch a product line and have it fail and you don't have a ladder trap, but launch a product line and sell six or seven figures of that product. And you were stuck into that product. <laughs> So, you know, that's the that's the the challenge with products. It's not if they fail, that's not hard. That's, you know, that's not a big deal. But if they are successful, then you're in a trap. Um, uh, the, also, financial choices, financing choices, taking out any big loan uh, can be a ladder trap um, or really any long term contract that you sign that has financial legal consequence to you, uh, you could say is a, is a ladder trap you need to think through. What are your thoughts on it? You have others to add to the list there? Lots. Yeah, I've, I've mm -hmm. fallen into a number of ladder shots myself and, and had clients that I see, you know, quite often. So this is actually, yeah, yeah. This is, there's a lot to discuss here. And I, I really think this is of huge value. It, it sounds very negative, but seeing bad things coming and then choosing not to go down a path means that what is left is, is more likely to be a good path. And I, I just think it's worth being very mindful about this stuff. I would say a couple of thoughts. First of all, your founding team or co-founder arrangement. Business partnerships can be a huge trap. I mean, two basic traps that I've seen a lot. The first phrase I've heard from a business coach, I can't remember who it is. He said, you can't have a good partnership with a bad partner and don't assume the other partner's the bad partner. I've been guilty of that. I've been the <laughs> less committed partner in an e-commerce partnership in the past. And, and yeah. that's not a, a fun thing to admit. But I probably should have said, I'm not going to do this because I haven't got the time and, and bandwidth to do it properly. And, and mm -hmm. looking back, I was embarrassed. Uh, my business partner was a smart, hardworking guy. We were also undercapitalized. So there are various other things. But, you know, looking back, it would have been a better decision to, to not work in that particular way. 
The other trap is that I've done myself to a degree and that I see a lot is that people work in a sort of pod. So they duplicate results, which is bad or even worse. You micromanage each decision. And you see that in, in <laughs> dysfunctional marriages to some degree. And we, we all have that with modern marriages. We don't have these clean divisions that you used to have. And you yeah. end up discussing a lot of things. But if you do that in a business partnership, you crawl forward compared to a competition. I, I really think that's a, a very easy trap to fall into, particularly if your only model of a two person operation is a marriage, because that's not a good plan to replicate that inefficient yeah. way of working. What you do know? you mean by I work in a pod explain that phrase to yeah, people what i mean is you, you kind of move around together so you both work on product development for a bit and then you both interfere with you know the, the design and then you both go and fuss about you get samples each uh, and you both yeah. discuss it to the nth degree and then yeah. you both work on okay. marketing and that's just I, i'm not saying you shouldn't both be involved to a degree but one person needs to be in charge of a particular area yeah. and i think the okay. simple divisions that i've seen that work well two two very simple models to put forward to people to consider and discuss with a business partner if it's new number one is ceo and coo you can both be equal owners of the business, but one is in charge of the overall business and one is in charge of operations. Another one that works very well is somebody's more product and uh, de product development and sourcing focus, and the other one is more marketing focus. That can also work, I think, very well. But as long as one person is in charge of a particular area, it doesn't mean the other person never gets involved, but they don't make the final decision. Yeah. You move forwards. In my experience, yeah. if you don't, you go around right. in that's, circles a lot. That's a whole podcast in and of itself. Yeah, working it in really, pods. Yeah. How, you know, the working in pods <laughs> trap. I never heard of that before, but that's yeah. so true. Okay. Yeah. What else is on your list of um, uh, mistakes, uh, ladder trap mistakes? Yeah. Just a couple. I mean, just to reference what you were saying about, you know, if something's succeeding and you've got six product lines there, then then you're going to be trapped. I think sometimes a sort of mediocre, just about surviving business can be the worst trap because it's not bad enough that it fails completely and it forces you to stop doing that and do something different but it's not really working and, and i think that's one thing you need to force things one way or the other the other possible traps that i've seen are the business model you're operating particularly a source of model if you um start importing stuff from china and your private labeling the time scales in which you tie up your money for are really big so that means it takes you a long time to to move the oil tank around if you decide to pivot um the second one is physical and digital products obviously you have a lot of experience of primarily digital product business uh physical products can if you're not careful about it have uh, characteristics that sort of trap you more easily i think because the, the money's tied up for longer the other one is products versus services and and that's an interesting one that yeah. you can probably speak to more than me because you guys have service side with the memberships yeah. and you have your digital products that are delivered without you physically being present and if you get that wrong services are not very easy to scale and that can be a real trap for a lot of people and yeah the the fourth one and the final thing is um, something i've got a lot of experience of content marketing like what we're doing i i love our conversation conversations uh, i don't always love having to sort of put together um interviews mm. with with uh i enjoy the interviews but i don't, I don't ha enjoy having to put that whole machine together produce content constantly every week and a lot of types of marketing like instagram marketing twitter it, it's here today and it's gone tomorrow versus oh, other yeah. forms of marketing where you create digital assets and then you run them on an automatic basis so those are different forms of kind of activity trap, if you like. I've yeah, well. yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought of that at all, but you're totally right. Any kind of content marketing. I mean, we're in a podcast trap. People yeah, expect are. us to do a podcast. <laughs> so that's content marketing traps. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're right. They, they do, to a lesser degree, um, they, they're traps. I would, in rank order, say that those are e more easily to just quit. You know, if, they, if you Agreed. stop tweeting on Twitter and your Twitter followers are bummed out, you're like, so what? But, you know, so but there's rank order to these, but they're all valid and they're things to consider. Yeah. I mean, I would say if your Twitter followers are bummed out, that's one thing. But if it's a driver of your business traffic, then that's something you can't so easily just take the foot off the gas of. And that's where I would say if you're big on Instagram and Pinterest pin posting, for example, and that requires a lot of manual work, then that would be an example of where that's harder to get out of, really. Totally. So tell me about some concrete, like, let's get personal about this and concrete example from your business of something that felt like a ladder trap, Jason. Mm, okay. All right. For <laughs> confessional time here. Confessional time. Here we go. <laughs> um, I have two examples that come to my mind. One is positive. One is negative, I guess you could say. Um, but both felt like the traps to us. Um, we recently made a decision to basically sign a contract that was a two-year term contract that was basically uh, thirty six thousand dollars a year, so so whatever seventy eight grand over two years, and it was a contract. Um, 
And after we did that, we were like, hmm, I wonder if this was really a wise idea <laughs> because that's a lot of money to come right out of the net profit of our business. And when we debated back and forth, we realized it was a real bear trap or, or ladder trap. We were into it. We signed. We, we made a commitment to a strategy and process, and there was no going back on it uh, without legal consequence. And so, so then we were stuck in and we were like, okay, now, now we have to kind of go down this path. Um, and so that was one example that was just recent. And, you know, as I think about this, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, uh, you know, a good, a good example. The other one, um, in, in our business is, you know, we, we had a, a physical product line that we did for years. It was a, for three years in particular, that was a six figure product line to us. And, um, there were a lot of, uh, negatives to it just a lot of you know kind of hassles and dramas and and the profit wasn't there it was revenue but not profit so much and so after three years of commitment to a specific product um we had the hard choice to make do we want to continue this and we you know because it was we have multiple streams of income in our business we were able to say we're done with this uh. in the in the way where we're doing it and so then you know we we shuttered it and we learned our lessons and we've reimagined how to do it differently. And we had real, you know, takeaways that we said to ourselves, okay, we could have learned or did learn, uh, you know, through the school of hard knocks. But um, that was not a, that was not a, a, a fatal business decision. You know, neither, neither of these examples in my uh, stories here are fate or fatal, but they're painful. And so I think that's the, you know, the question as it relates to these ladder traps is, you know, some of these can be terminal, you know, you, you start down some of these paths and you're done if you, you know, it, because you can't, you can't, uh, they're not retractable or, or, uh, you know, fixable. And so I think, I think that's the thing to think through with the, you know, in, in our businesses. And so anyway, those are a couple examples. Yeah, I like that. I think the retractable or fixable piece is, is actually is something worth deep diving into a bit. Mm -hmm. I, but I should first return, you know, honor you with that return of some, uh, you know, <laughs> airing some dirty washing. I, I would say a couple of classic traps that I've been in, uh, one I would say I'm in now. One is in the private label business products. I think that whole business model was not right for me on my own. Let's put it that way, because mm. a lot of it had um, implications of product development. Or I, the first thing is I did pure private label, which wasn't even back in 2014 very defensible. So as a business model, I should have either gone further and gone for custom products yeah. or um, just done something simpler like wholesale mm. arrangements, which given my business to business and discussion skills if i'd known about that model would have probably probably suited me better yeah um so i did i learned a lot of skills which have stood me in good stead in terms of teaching others who've done a lot better with those than i have and are more comfortable with those like importing from china but it was a business model that demanded a a fundamental orientation that i don't have towards product development i'm just not that passionate about it but the solution now is that i'm developing more sort of loose partnerships with people who are very passionate about that the other one is podcasting content marketing as the lead source for the amazing fba sort of side of things that the coaching consulting and my solution is that i'm just trying to you know wean myself off creating things you know in a daily and weekly view mm -hmm. and trying to create some mm -hmm. books and lead magnets and developing on uh, funnels that allow the economics of paid advertising to work really so um that's really the the thing that i'm trying to move to which yeah. i guess brings me to the point of of the question of how do we avoid ladder traps in the first place because mm -hmm. obviously you talked about them being pretty painful no yeah. need to go through that pain if we don't have to so so how do we go about that yeah i mean i think that's the, the you know <laughs> the uh the, the lessons here turn into almost cliches and we don't want them to be cliches but you know um the the old cliche that it comes to my mind is uh an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. And so some of this thinking is just, you know, prior, you know, not stepping on a ladder trap, you know, step one, don't step on a ladder trap, but, but, you know, that's easier said than done. And we all, you know, make these choices and then realize that they were mistakes or errors or challenges or problems. So I think there, there are a set of um, ideas that you can um, implement in your business to really mitigate the, the risk. I, I would say the first one is test small and commit small. Um, and, and I'm, you know, a big fan of thinking things through ahead of time um, as much as possible to make sure that you're really implementing something that you're actually super excited about. Um, and it's it's got to be one of those things where, uh, you know, is it even rise to the level of a test 
in your business. Um, and you've got to get better and better at the kind of discretion to say no to stuff. I think of Steve Jobs, you know, he was at Apple. The Mac computer was his big baby. It was a big flop at first. And then he got fired. And then, but when he came back, Apple was in the state of affairs that it had, I, I think, hundreds or even more products. And he famously walked into the conference room and drew a four quadrant grid on the board and said, "These is this is our product strategy. And it was like, you know, four, four machines. And, um, and so I think the, the test small commit small thing is, is a real challenge, but you've got to, you've got to have a mental discipline to say to yourself, mm, I like this idea and I am entrepreneurial and I like every idea I have, but this doesn't rise to the occasion. So that's one. The second thing is um, never get involved in a land war in Asia. <laughs> so just <laughs> it's a little joke from princess bride there, but you know, some things are just notoriously bad business <laughs> ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, I would put on that, that category for me personally, I would put never get involved in a network marketing business or MLM business. So, you know, so some of these choices are, you know, you, you just have to think through for yourself what looks like a complete and total bad idea to you. Um, but then, you know, the, the other um, tip, third tip more practically is whenever big money is on the line, seek real counsel from professionals and wise advice before you sign anything. Um, and you know, that, that's just a, I think of a sage advice piece. Do not sign on to something unless you've really got a multitude of counselors telling you, yeah, this seems to make sense. This is a good idea, you know? Uh, and then my fifth tip would be, uh, do not succumb to the marketers time pressure or scarcity tactics in their marketing. If, it, if it's anything like a service or a, a deal or whatever, don't succumb to high pressure tactics. Um, and really think, through objectively is this something i really need um and and is it something i'm going to install in my business you know for the long term and so those are my four tips for you know dealing with uh, how to avoid you know what are your thoughts yeah i really like these i think test small commit small is is really wise um mm -hmm. related to that some business models or product types you know lend themselves to that and some don't mm -hmm. which says to me if you don't know what you're doing yet, start with something that will enable you to test it on a small scale, which rules out a lot of stuff, which is really helpful. If you have too much choice, mm -hmm. then things that rule out most options are very helpful filters, contrary to what you might uh, expect. Having lots of options is not better for choice making. It really mm -hmm. isn't. It mm -hmm. feels like it should be. Uh, so for me, that would rule out private label as a, a first choice in e-commerce, even though a lot, lots of people I know have done incredibly well in it, but mostly because they started with retail arbitrage or latterly quite a few of my clients are going mm -hmm. from wholesale deals like doing a million dollars a year in wholesale and then adding private label products they have cash flow they have expertise uh so anything yeah. that doesn't allow yeah. a small start is something to be at least very mindful of um well in that other, situation yeah. if i can just speak into that situation Please. for a moment then what they started with was a niche or industry that in a with a business model they could start small wholesale mm. selling maybe yeah. with a minimum moq or something like that and then they learned the niche or industry and then they added a higher risk sourcing strategy or business model to what they already had complementary going, which is very smart tactic. It's like incrementally stepping your way into a niche with product strategies that are, you know, more complicated or harder to execute on, but you've got the background and expertise and hopefully a list of customers and, and all that kind of thing. So mm. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's a, it's a good example of mitigating your risk going into, you know, making sure the ladder is leaned up against the right tree and then then stepping up the rungs of it you know yeah well i guess that kind of implies part of the solution as well as the, the prevention thing which is two sides of the same coin like i mean trying to avoid setting yourself up for failure in the first place i guess is what we're discussing but also you don't necessarily know going in so don't make a massive commitment and mm -hmm. talking of which a related but not quite the same point seth godin i think is a, fa a big fan of setting a specific amount of money and or specific time frame preferably both after which you make a no-go decision um, a, a go or no go or no go mm -hmm. or kill decision but you set that up in advance which is so smart because psychologically you're going to be you're going to be sunk in the sunk cost fallacy by the time you get a year into something if you're private labeling something or if you created a business that mm -hmm. takes a lot of effort like a shopify store yeah. you've got a lot of creativity gone into it you've worked so hard to get your traffic yeah you need to have some hard numbers where you've discussed that in advance like okay where do we call this if it yeah. isn't profitable or isn't making revenue or whatever it is by a certain point do you do you have a point where you cut it off and that's, so, those are not easy decisions yeah i totally agree sunk cost fallacy is a huge part of this so you want to walk through a little bit of that because there's two pieces in my mind one is the 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 money that you've spent 
Mm. The other piece of it is your time is a yes. sunk cost as well. And you have that around your, your head, you know, it's like a, it's like a, you know, a, a, you know whatever. It's just a, the weight on your shoulders is how much time you've spent on some strategy yeah. that you have to walk away from. So yeah, that's a huge I, part I of think it. you're right. Let, let's, let's talk about that. Then, since you're mentioning, it. I think the third part of the sunk cost fallacy is, is really hard to get your head around and your pride's going to want to tell you that it doesn't exist. If you're a, a you know, straight male which is emotional sunk cost um it's mm -hmm. hard to admit to yourself that what you've been doing for a year is just wrong but it's hard to admit to yourself sometimes or for me anyway maybe i'm just undeveloped but it's hard to admit to yourself <laughs> that it's hard to admit to yourself you think like oh i'm a businessman i'm i'm a hunter gatherer alpha male i am not driven by emotion but of course the truth is of course i am and i'm an artistic type at least i'm but can fall back on that and go oh well of course i'm emotional so i think that emotional sunk cost can sometimes be the worst mm -hmm. the unwillingness to go I was wrong and I committed time and effort and made promises to my wife or family or whatever it is. Right. And you've got to go, okay, I was wrong. And you got to say to mm -hmm. other people, I'm sorry, I was wrong, but I'm going to, you know, adjust and, and iterate and, and work towards fixing it. Well, the motions that you're talking about are pride, ego. <laughs> yes. Um, also you have to, to, to walk away from something you have to admit that you were wrong. So there's a degree of humility there to say, I messed up especially if you have a team around you. It's one thing if you're a kitchen table entrepreneur by yourself. It's another thing if you've got a team member or, or a larger team that you've rallied their enthusiasm in support of your idea. You've, you've, you've focused them and their energy and effort on an idea. And all of that is sunk cost then if you abandon the, uh, the idea. And, and so that's a huge part of this because you're, your status as a leader and all of those elements go into that whole emotional equation, which is a, it's a big, real uh, problem. I mean, it's a, it's a big reason why people don't step back off these ladders yeah. and untangle themselves out of them. Um, yeah. It reminds me of the Stockdale paradox, which is one of the Jim Collins things that he mentions in Good to Great or one of his books, which I believe I've even got it written up here because I'm on a board here because I find it such a great go to. He talks about the Stockdale paradox, which I believe Jim Stockdale was. And correct me if I'm wrong, if you know different. He, mm -hmm. he was a prisoner of war in, I think, Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, there are multitudes of foreign wars that the Americans have. You could choose. <laughs> and uh, he survived by believing, by being brutally honest with himself, but also having faith that he would find his way out of the situation. And I think that that mentality mix is really hard, but that is really 100% what, what an entrepreneur needs, is you've got to have faith that you'll work mm -hmm. your way out of it, mm -hmm. but equally admit the truth. <laughs> yeah. And uh, some of the great business leaders are very obsessed with the word truth, whatever that means. And, and Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos is, for example, one of those. So he was an optimistic realist, not a delusional <laughs> like pessimist. He, he was yeah. being very honest about his circumstance, but also had the hope of the future, yeah. I think so. If that's my understanding, I mean, obviously, there are probably very deep psychological studies that may disagree. But as a general principle, I think that that works. Yeah. The talking of which talking of um, stepping outside your own head, I think your idea of wise advice is really, really important. I mean, yeah, the, the yeah. thing is, a lot of entrepreneurs seem to go veer between I wanted to fire my boss. Why would I ask anyone's opinion? And just following what the guru says and, and neither mm -hmm. i think is right you have to have your own intuition instincts and those will get better over time you're going to learn from mistakes and that's just mm -hmm. the best way to learn but it's the most painful way to learn however it's really super smart to talk to lawyers but particularly accountants and small business accountants in my experience who've been around the block for a few decades have seen a lot of things come and go and they will have seen patterns and they can pass those patterns on to you they're by their nature somewhat risk averse people. So they aren't always going to be the people whose advice you slavishly follow, but at least getting a sense of their view, I, I just think is incredibly yeah. good plan. And, and a few of us talk to in our accountants enough, I think. Well, the other part of that conversation, of course, is just the internal conversation with your team members. You know, one of the smartest things any leader can do is just be completely honest about the situation you find yourself in with your team and, and own it. You know, I mean, it, if, chances are your team is more clear on the problems occurring in your business than you are. So, you know, to the extent that you can just say, friends, we're stuck. We have a problem. This is a, this is a, you know, a big, you know, situation we're in and I need to be honest about the decision-making around it and get your opinion and just solicit the opinions of your team members. I mean, that, that can be massively valuable and it's a step of humility and it includes them in, 
creating a new future. So I think there's there's huge wisdom in that. And so that whole piece of seeking counsel and advice doesn't have to be expensive or or a special. It can be your team and their wisdom and insight might really unlock new ideas for you. And there's humility in there in, in terms of listening and understanding their points of view and uh, and being a good uh, partner in, in the work, you know, with your team members. Yeah, yeah that's very true. <laughs> Um, so another few ways that, that spring to mind to avoid ladder traps, I think you need to look the big picture stuff. I think the big picture is underrated as a thing that determines outcomes. I think everyone very naturally in the e-commerce space, particularly above all in the Amazon focus space, tends to be fed such a strong diet of it's all about the platform. It's all about the hacks. It's all about the tactics that they really don't take strategic decisions seriously enough until they've been in business for a few years, by which time, as you said, you can be locked in. So I would say the business model you're running, if you don't even know what a business model is, or you're not sure what it is, it is really worth taking the time to examine it from a 60,000 foot view and sort of do a diagram of it. Don't just rough out some form of flow chart. You don't have to be super scientific you know, bash it around, talk it through with wise people that have been in the space for several decades. I know you've got a, a mentor that you talk to, you you mentor people, I help people that are new to e-commerce and just yeah. get a sense of how does this thing operate? And then if your comment says, says, oh, but surely that means by year three, you'd have to involve, you know, $500,000 of working capital to reach my target. Mm -hmm. That may be a true insight, in which case you may not choose to do that business model. So looking at it as a whole system, it, it's hard to do, but I think it's really important. Um, yeah. Second thing to avoid traps is think about physical versus digital products and, and whether that's really, you know, the cash flow characteristics, for example, of physical something you, you really want to get into. Mm -hmm. Products versus services. Think about if you scale this up, and um, we talked about scalability before, really important. Is this going to become a nightmare if this succeeds? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, how sustainable is my marketing as well? I've talked about content versus ad-driven. So, yeah. yeah. So those are ways to avoid ladder traps. What are your thoughts that if we feel or, or discover, as many of us do, my, myself, I've certainly been in that situation, my clients as well. If you feel that your ladder is leaning against the wrong tree, how do we sort of unpick that and get, get it leaning on the right tree? Yeah, I, I do think there are specific things that you can do if you feel like you're, you're stuck into the wrong deal and wrong situation. I think the first one is read your contracts and relook at your deal structure. And sometimes that means going back and looking at prior literal contracts or the service level agreement of some, you know, you know, a vendor or something like that. Um, some deal that you signed off on. Um, other times it's going back and looking at your emails and be like, Wait, what, if, what was, what was this original arrangement? And um, just take a, a set of a fresh eyes approach to it and, and relook at it. Um, I think the, you know, the, the next thing would be to step back from that and then blue, blue sky, uh, you know, a blue ocean strategy, the situation, given the situation you're in, what are the options that exist? And I think there's valuable work that can be done there. Um, frequently, that means maybe if you're in a ladder trap, you can't get off that ladder, but you can minimize it in your business. You can marginalize it in, in essence and um, diminish its meaning or importance in your business um, strategically. Um, you know, a third thing you can do is, again, as we've already talked about, understand the sunk cost fallacy and really put on the table or on a piece of paper the list of what things did I invest into this and what does it look like to walk away from those things? But just be honest about it. Um, the opposite side of sunk cost fallacy, fallacy is opportunity cost. So the question, if you start from like day one is today, like Jeff Bezos's mantra, and you say to yourself, starting today, day, this is day one for my new future business, um, then what is like the zero base approach to it? And zero base budgeting is an old phrase from whenever 90s or whatever, where you would let, literally every year you'd say your budget for anything in your business is zero. And then everybody would have to justify like, no, no, I, I really need, you know, the money for my, my <laughs> Clavio account. So we can do email marketing. Okay. You may have, you know, $250 a month, you know, you, you zero base your whole entire uh, business. That's day one thinking. And I think that's really, really valuable. Um, and uh, then I, you know, I also think you probably need to, um, I guess go meta, not in the Facebook use of meta, but go meta for a moment and ask yourself, why am I 
why did my behavior lead me to be in these situations? What was it about my decision-making process and my framework that allowed me to be in this mess? And do I have a system in place where I proactively avoid and then uh, manage problematic uh, bear, uh, bear traps or, or ladder traps? And I think that's an important key is to think through um, what does my system look like for examining what we're doing. And maybe it's an annual planning day. Maybe it's a quarterly uh, examination of your profit and your expenses. Maybe it's, uh, you know, some other kind of special, uh, you know, event that you do where you really examine these things. So anyway, so those are some some things to consider and do if you're stuck into uh, ladder traps right now. I know what your thoughts on those are, Michael. Yeah, I, I like that. And one thing we talked about um, before we went on air is a very interesting that I'd like to pull your thoughts out about this. You were talking about how much you reflect on experience and, and whether you even recognize or, or admit to yourself. And we talked about the emotional difficulty, but sometimes it's a cognitive thing, like you don't realize you're in a trap. And so mm -hmm. you were talking about the different types of hedonic and something else, the sort of relationship we have to oh. reflection. Yeah, yeah. Interesting topic. Tell us more about that. Well, I should have, I should have probably... Uh, Google it up a little bit, but um, <laughs> th let me just describe for you what I was talking about and then people can search around for it. So there's a psychological test that you can do and it basically puts you into a, a three part framework and it's really interesting. And uh, every one of us has this approach uh, in terms of mental uh, you know, framework that we bring to, to things. And there's three, the three buckets are um, uh, past oriented. So we're, in our mind, we're constantly reliving the past, thinking about what happened previously. So that's a mindset. The second one is they call hedonic, which is, you know, hedonism, which is, but it specifically means being in the moment, thinking about this specific moment with all of your, you know, kind of mental energy. Um, and that's, so that's a hedonic. And then the, the third one is future oriented, where you're a dreamer. And you're just constantly dreaming up new things. And that three set thing, I, it might come out of, uh, uh, is it, um, oh gosh, uh, Mindset by Dwick. Uh, was her name Helen Dwick or something like that? I know you, but yeah. anyway, I, it might be from that. It might be tied to that. But anyway, people yeah. can search for that, but just search for the, uh, and we might put it in the show notes. I'll find it. And, but the concept is important because what mm. it does when you do this little test is it says, well, you're 30% past oriented and 70% future oriented and 0% hedonic. And um, so you need to practice being present in the moment, you know, or, or focus on that piece. So that's the kind of intelligence that gives you. Um, and, you know, if you run your business where you're constantly just in the moment or future oriented, like shiny objects, the future is going to be great. I'm going to do new things. And you never have that past orientation of reflection, contemplation, uh, examination of prior results, if that's just not how you're wired in your DNA, then you're probably going to have a harder time with, you know, this ladder trap uh, situation. Yeah. Agreed. And by the way, um, thank you for explaining that because I have no idea what the official psychological terms are, but the, the concept is really, really clear. And I think mm -hmm. it's a very simple and very important, profound psychological thing. And it requires self-knowledge. If you're just self-aware enough to know that you really don't like something, my suggestion is, again, the who, not how thing, that if you know that you're not good, for example, as I am at looking at current specific realities mm -hmm. in the financial sense, you have to hire a bookkeeper. I mean, that's what I've done mm -hmm. recently. And and uh, in fact, in the process of sort of thrashing around, maybe hiring mm -hmm. a different one because it's been hard to work with because I'm a nightmare to work with because I'm really not good at that. But you have to work that through. And and, and my suggestion is really simple. There's an area you're really weak on. Mm -hmm. You have to get some help. <laughs> you know, yeah. don't ignore yeah. it because inability to reflect on the yeah. past is going to condemn you to yeah. repeat it into the future, which if it's not working is not a good plan. And so, yeah, get an accountant in for books or mm -hmm. a marketing expert if your marketing's terrible or a sourcing expert if your sourcing's terrible, etc. I found the reference. It's a book called um, The Time Paradox by Philip Zimbardo. And there's a test called the ZTPI test. And that's where this all comes from. So that's the book. And uh, I, I encourage people to check it out. There's an on the online little test that you can do. I think it's free. I don't remember. But it was very interesting to go through. Yeah, very, it, very, very yeah. good stuff. I like that a lot because yeah. a lot of... Um, what strikes me is extremely simple and yet profound uh, pattern that I see. People who want to start businesses and never do, who don't take enough action. Mm -hmm. They think mm -hmm. too much. I'm yeah. I'm prone to over analysis. People who are big on 
taking action and actually get into creating six or maybe early seven figure business are very, very action or and operations mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. But those guys tend to hit a wall at some point as well. They either have to sell the business or they're going to get to the next step. They really have to stand back and reflect, which I, I find the masterminds are where you see people blinking and going, mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, I haven't thought about this <laughs> in this way before. And, and to try and persuade people not to just focus on operations is quite hard. But I think they generally hit a wall and that's when they're open to thinking about it. So. Yeah. Uh, it is a real thing, the ability to reflect, uh, but it is not a substitute for action. I think there's a rhythm, isn't there? You take action, you stand back and lick your wounds or you celebrate and then you yeah. go, right, how can we replicate that success or how can we never do that again? <laughs> like with your contract <laughs> that you thought, wow, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. do that again. You know, yeah. A um, couple of other thoughts about how to uh, pivot things around. I think uh, there's there's a really useful rule of thumb, which Jeff Bezos, I think, was very fond of decision type one versus type two. One is reversible or non-reversible decisions. I think you need to be much more mindful about irreversible decisions or not totally irreversible, but not getting into a pickle in the first place, I guess. This is more about prevention than cure, I suppose, but it's all related. Um, you really should educate yourself. You should talk it through with your experts. Uh, you should talk it through with your team, business partner, um, life partner, if they're different people. But also to give you enough headspace to turn the ship around if it's needed, you should get out of the habit of over discussing reversible decisions because you can micromanage those quite easily and and get quite happy about the fact that you oh, spent, you know, yeah. ages perfecting one particular mm -hmm. infographic and your business model as a whole is broken. It's yeah. so easy to fall into that because it's kind of satisfying and, and safe but not very effective. I've never thought of it that way before, but you're totally right. I, that's so, I love that. That's Bezos, uh, reversible or, or not reversible decisions. The similarity there to the Robert Ronsat corridor principle is interesting. I mm -hmm. guess it's like the corridor principle says, if you walk down a corridor, there are doors you see appear to you that you ha wouldn't been have been able to see if you hadn't walked down that path. But I guess to extend his corridor principle there are those doors you can walk through that are not reopenable from the other side and there are doors that are openable again you just get back out of the deal and you're like no never mind i'm not doing that i'm going to somewhere else but yeah. this is very interesting to tie these all these ideas together yeah yes exactly yes yeah, some some doors uh, are in corridors and some aren't, I think. I mean, if you mm. spend all of your life savings on some private label product, then, you know, it doesn't mean you can never start a business, but it's going to really mm -hmm. slow that down. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are mindful about just being humble about the fact that you're probably going to get some decisions wrong and you you never spend all your money on something or to your point um painful but not fatal was a very good phrase mm. if any outcome of a decision the worst it can be is is painful but not fatal that's a good decision fatal for your business let's not go <laughs> too dark but you know that that's a very good basic principle is that whatever decision you make should not have the potential to kill your business off if it doesn't work out and yeah very yeah. simple but i mean again that's much more prevention than cure i guess in terms of prevention once you realize you're you know <laughs> there's a very old phrase we have in britain which is when you're in a hole stop digging so mm. if you realize that something isn't working we talked about this before but being prepared to quit i mean the sunk cost mm -hmm. fallacy is the fallacy mm -hmm. the, the the medicine is quitting strategically not quitting when it's getting hard but that's just a natural dip as the seth Godin calls it so market adoption is is a painfully long so process sometimes if you're doing your own marketing um you know getting responses to your social media marketing might take you a year and at, at month three you might want to quit but then having more rational quitting points and using those mm -hmm. means you quit doing the the part of your business the product line the partnership the sourcing strategy whatever it is that isn't working which frees up time money and energy mm -hmm. to do the other things that could work yeah um, yeah that's the most important thing totally agree um, there's so many economic ideas or principles this ties into, you know, we've talked in prior episodes about asymmetrical risk reward. And so I encourage people to go back and to listen to that episode. And the idea there is that there are some decisions that have small investment and massive uh, potential in, you know, result, positive result. And that whole idea of small decision, big future outcome could apply to ladder traps. There are some, you know, some seemingly small decisions that you make that can be ladder traps as well that have then these big long-term implications. And you say to yourself, man, I am so bummed we made that choice so long ago. So that, uh, that applies to this as well, where there's literally like orders of magnitude size impact in your business that has, uh, has consequence uh, as it relates to the ladders as well. So 
It's true. But the last thing I would say is related to that. A lot of this stuff is really hard to predict. You don't know what you don't know when you start something. Mm -hmm. and, and also the, the ability to just run the, the operational basics of learning a course, you know, it's a video course or a YouTube course, or, you know, you've got a ton of Udemy courses mm -hmm. and they're very good as far as they go. But you have to start with the, the tactical day to day basics because you can't get your head around other things. But it's the ability mm -hmm. to see a business model in the abstract is much harder which i think is therefore it's it's rarer it's harder to explain it's harder to kind of put across it's harder to monetize but i'm really pleased that we do focus on that because i think at a certain point you see it more as a whole and that's mm -hmm. the only it's only when you see a business model as a whole or, or a, a business as a whole uh, you know the, one year's worth of financials for example that you can start to evaluate it and mm -hmm. so really you you're going to have to uh, allow for being wrong and i think the solution as we've talked about we've got a whole section of the podcast about pivoting which i haven't talked about for a while but it's a really important concept because mm -hmm. what it means is you can go in the wrong direction for a while but still save your business by by flipping aspects of it keeping some aspects the same and some turning through 90 degrees or even more so you can stay in the same industry but mm -hmm. but source completely differently so for example yeah. you might stay in the industry of, of dolls clothes but instead of selling physical products on ebay you sell digital patterns as you and cinnamon did you could uh keep the same exact product line on amazon for example or, or a shopify store and you've been sourcing it from china and you've had an utter nightmare maybe you start sourcing it from the uk your profit margins change but it's just a sourcing nightmare mm -hmm. you could stay on the same platform on amazon but flip between retail arbitrage maybe that's getting really hard to source you move to wholesale for more consistency or you move from pure ra to whatever that is to replens you know there's lots of ways you, you can move i mean in my case i can stay in the same industry but but change partnership um, model so instead of me being you know responsible for everything i'm these days partnering right now i've got a couple of joint ventures in in process there uh, with people who are obsessive and expert product developers, which is my mm -hmm. great, great, I don't have a great interest in that, but I love the marketing piece. And so that is a partnership that, that's, uh, those are the partnerships that are coming together. So yeah. it's, it's not really a violent change. It's leveraging my abilities, but it's getting rid of the stuff off my plate and bringing other people into account for my weaknesses, which is also a smart move generally as well. Love it. Well, what a great conversation, man. This is such an interesting uh, set of leadership questions and decisions all the way from Stephen Covey to uh, uh, all the uh, other books we've referenced. Uh, do we mention the Steve, the Derek Stevers book as well? No, Derek Stevers, nice hell yeah or no, is, yeah. is one we didn't reference actually. And forgive me saying the yeah. H word, uh, but uh, that yeah. is part of the title. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a really interesting book. I mean, I've got it right here on my shelf and it's basically, if it's not a, if you, you're not really totally enthusiastic about an idea, you should probably say no, which mm -hmm. Having done a lot of the ones where I'm kind of lukewarm about it, I can say it's the crash test done for that. Yes, it's yeah. a good plan to follow that. Yeah. Um, well, let me wrap it up here for us and summarize and, uh, and thank everybody for listening. So if you're in a business decision that feels intractable, then uh, you've stepped on a ladder trap. And hopefully this episode has been helpful to give you strategies and ideas for uh, getting yourself untangled from that ladder and repositioning it against the right wall so you can start climbing properly in the direction you want to go. So appreciate everybody listening today. Uh, Michael, as always, it's a great conversation to have with you. And uh, it's an honor to be able to do the podcast with you. Any final call to actions or comments? Uh, yeah, I, I'd love for you could just summarize quickly what we've covered because we cover quite a few topics. It'd be nice to pull it together for people if that's possible. Sure. Um, if you are stuck in a ladder trap maybe it's related to your founding team choice your niche or industry your product line your financing strategies or any long-term contracts that you've uh, participated in uh, then and, and maybe even business model product type or physical product uh, product uh, versus service uh, and on and on then you've got some hard choices to make um, and so we'd encourage you to consider reading the contracts or agreements you've made, stepping back and seeking wise counsel and understanding sunk cost fallacy and how it's playing with your mind. And if you're stuck on a ladder trap right now, then we'd really encourage you to figure out how to go forward and avoid them. Avoiding them can best be done by testing small and committing small. Uh, never getting involved in a land war in Asia, which is a joke, of course, for Princess Bride uh, fans, but you get the idea. Never commit to a big, crazy idea. Um, and n when big money is on the line, uh, always seek counsel and advice. And finally, 
do not succumb to marketers, time pressure or scarcity tactics that are designed to get you to make hasty decisions. And so with that, hopefully uh, it's a good summary of the topic of ladder traps. And uh, there you have it. Absolutely. And um, by the way, uh, the reason that the uh, scarcity and fear and whatever for marketers works is an internal problem for us in the end. It's fear or greed, isn't it? And we need to manage those emotions in ourselves is what I would say. So that um, talking of wise counsel, uh, obviously, we uh, <laughs> if you think I'm wise. Well, certainly, I think you're wise, Jason. So if people want to come to you. I, I've certainly got experience. I think wisdom <laughs> wisdom is gradually coming with the gray hairs. Uh, so winning on Shopify and 10K Collective are the two places. Tell us a little bit about what you offer for entrepreneurs in terms of wise counsel at the winning on Shopify sort of stable of, of services these days. Sure. Yeah. Kyle and I do a couple different uh, things in our business. We do one on one coaching and consulting. Um, with uh, veteran e-commerce operators. We don't work with folks who are startups or brand new to it. But if you've got a, you know, effective uh, product strategy and are, you know, growing your sales, uh, then we uh, have a one-on-one -on -one consulting that could be of interest. We have an application page on winningonshopify.com. And uh, Kyle focuses on Amazon and Walmart channels i focus on shopify and, and branding and marketing strategies uh, and then we also have small group uh, opportunity as well so that's uh that's how you can find it winning on shopify.com we're rebranding and so soon that'll redirect to our new brand but until then that's the place to find the the details in the application for one-on-one -on -one coaching yeah so if you want to uh, come and, and find out more about me. I do also one-to-one -one stuff. Uh, I think the best thing we offer these days is the masterminds. We've got the 10K Collective Masterminds, which really range from businesses anywhere from um, mid six figures to high seven figures, I suppose in dollar terms, Virgil on eight figures in the biggest cases. Um, and I'm also starting a new group that I'm quite excited about sort of in early days uh, for six figure operators to get them from the sort of, you know, 10, $20,000 a month range up towards the, the next level. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I've, I had somebody email me literally yesterday about it. So just email me, Michael at amazingfba.com. Otherwise, you can find the mastermind at the amazonmastermind.com. Amazingly still up, uh, even though that's blatantly infringing on IP. And I didn't say that publicly, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, if, if not, you can find it at amazingfba.com. You'll find the stuff there. But for the moment, the Amazon Mastermind is still up. So do you come and find us there. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Jason, it's been a great discussion. I, I really think this yeah. is a, a, a topic where I see a lot of pain and, and not much discussion about how mm -hmm. to solve it. So it's really good. Thank you for, for bringing that topic up. Really like it. Yeah. Okay. That's the show. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks everybody for listening live with us. As always, it's an honor to uh, do this live. And uh, so if you'd um, like to connect with us going forward, of course, you can just email us directly or leave comments underneath where you're watching this video, if you're watching via replay and uh, we'll be sure to snag those. So as always, Michael, this is great, man. Good time. Yeah, Likewise. Good, yep. good, good discussion. All right. I'm going to end it here. Thanks everybody.